Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Michigami, and I'm pleased to be the facilitator today. I'm the Secretary General of TCS, Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. TCS is an international organization established by the three governments of China, Japan, and Korea in 2011. Today, we have three distinguished speakers from China, Japan, and Korea. Also, Dr. Kasai from WHO as a special guest. Now, let me invite Mr. Gumbert, head of UNESCO East and Northeast Asia office for our opening remarks. Excellency. Thank you. And a warm welcome to you all. Good afternoon from UNESCO East and Northeast Asia office here in Incheon, Korea. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the webinar jointly organized by TCS at our office. Thank you for your support. We have received over 2,000 registrations for more than 70 countries. Before I begin, please allow me to extend my personal wish to everyone that you and your family are keeping safe and healthy at this difficult time. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges to the world. Following the outbreaks of COVID-19 over the past months, countries are now moving towards the second phase of the pandemic, where social distancing and prevention measures are kept in place while resuming and reopening economic activities to the extent possible. The journey back to recovery is not easy. Countries must resist the urge to go back to business as usual. But the countries that have been dealing with COVID-19 the longest and having achieved a degree of success in containing this history. China, Japan, and, and the Republic of Korea have been paving the way for other countries in terms of managing the pandemic. There is a small window of opportunity for the three countries to lead the global recovery efforts. Today's discussions will highlight their experiences and best practices, as well as areas for, uh, for possible joint activities to build back better together. The UNESCO firmly believes that this crisis can be taken as an opportunity to reorient the development approach. With this in mind, we will focus on three streams of works. First, supporting economic recovery. Second, protecting people and enhancing resilience. And third, restoring supply chains and supporting small and medium enterprises. As the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, we are only as strong the weakest health system in our interconnected world. Solidarity is the only way to win the war against the virus. While China, Japan and the Republic of Korea have demonstrated concrete strategies on managing the pandemic and promoting sustainable recovery, I hope we will have uh, fruitful exchanges in the coming one and a half hours, thereby distilling ways to build back together at this challenging time. Thank you, Excellency. I'm also very delighted to co-host this meaningful milestone event with UNESCO. We hear many voices of many countries that they want to know more from China, Japan and Korea about their response to COVID-19. This webinar is to share our experiences and learn together. I express my deepest condolences to those who have lost their loved ones. My respect goes to the frontline medical and ad administrative professionals. And I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the three governments, especially health ministries for the support. The virus has spread around the globe with over 10 million infection cases and over 500,000 deaths. Many people say that China, Japan and Korea, CJK, have all successfully kept the outbreak under control, keeping fatality rate low, although the three countries took different strategies and measures. China took strong containment measures, including lockdown of large cities, and utilized big data to track patients and their contacts. Japan took the counter-cluster approach 
and created an easy to understand message for social distancing. They kept the rate of virus testing relatively low and successfully avoided the collapse of medical system. Korea is also known as a successful model for the government's proactive measures based on the lessons of MERS, MERS, utilization of ICT in tracing contacts and effective nationwide cooperation. They had a relatively high rate of virus testing. In the triangle scheme of CJK, we have 21 ministerial meetings. Among them, health ministers meet has been addressing infectious diseases since 2007. Even in the difficult time of COVID-19, three countries had information exchanges. And in this context, we have today's epoch-making webinar. The pandemic is still unfolding. Post-corona era has not come yet. We are still with corona. Recently, CJK all experienced sporadic increase. I hope the three countries' experiences can be widely shared in the world to flatten the curve on COVID-19. Now, speaker's introduction. We are very honored to have prominent leading experts of China, Japan, and Korea. Dr. Wu chun -yo, Chief Epidemiologist of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Oshitani Hitoshi, Professor of Tohoku University and a key member of the Japanese government's COVID-19 advisory panel, heading the cluster-based approach. Dr. Yi Hyun-min, Professor of Severance Hospital, Yonsei University, a special advisory member of the Korea Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters on COVID-19. All of them are playing a central role in each country to respond to COVID-19. Dr. Kasai Takeshi is Regional, Regional Director of WHO Office for Western Pacific. He is based in Manila. We have already received many questions. Thank you and the window is still open. Please send your questions to the provided email address before the Q&A session starts. Thank you. We are looking forward to sharing with you the best practices of COVID-19 responses by China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. To start with, may I now introduce Dr. Wu Jun-Yu. Dr. Wu is a key member of the Chinese government's COVID-19 response team. He also plays an important role in controlling the recent infections in Beijing. He has made significant contributions to China's public health policy against the SARS outbreak in 2003, as well as to prevent HIV-AIDS infection. Dr. Wu, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction. Could I have my slides shared with the screen? So my slide is remote controlled in the Secretariat. So could someone help to uh, upload, share, We're waiting for assistant to upload the slides. 
Okay, yes, yeah. So now you can start, start, Dr. Wu. Yes, we are waiting for uh, slides uploading. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. So I think the slides are up already on the screen. Uh, we cannot see the screen. Oh, it's already there? Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, I just go ahead to uh, talk, and then you can, if you can see, see the screen, that's fine. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you China's response to COVID-19 in China. So the next slide, slide number two, um, I want to bring you back to a few months ago, the early events, to review the early events that occurred in China. On December 27th, initial cases of pneumonia with uh, unknown etiology was reported by Dr. Zhang Jixian. Uh, that report uh, called uh, Local Health Authority Attention, they issued alert on December 30th. Then December 31st, National Health Commission and China CDC involved in investigation. The early investigation identified most early cases had a common exposure to Huanan seafood market. Then they made a decision the market was closed immediately on January 1st. On January 3rd, even we do not know the pathogen for the pneumonia, we reported the epidemic information to WHO and also Japan and Korea. On January 7th, SARS-CoV-2 was isolated and identified as a pathogen for this epidemic. On January 9th, we reported to WHO this etiology assessment result. On January 10th, RT-PCR test kits was developed and sent to Wuhan for diagnosis. On January 11th, we start daily reporting epidemic situation to WHO. On January 12th, we shared the virus sequence with WHO. We uploaded the data to the WHO global database. That sharing makes all other countries to make a diagnostic keys. On January 20th, COVID-19 was added to notifiable diseases in China. On January 23rd, Wuhan city was shut down. In the next few days, the other 15 cities in Hubei also locked down. Review the initial three weeks we made a very rapid response. It only took seven days to identify pathogen for this outbreak. That may create the record in the human history responding to emerging infectious disease. It only took two days to de develop diagnostic test kits. The most important scientific finding in the early response include virus isolation, identification, develop 
test the kids determine incubation period for the COVID-19, determine transmission mode for COVID-19. These four major scientific findings provide scientific evidence to develop control strategy for China and for the world. So that's a significant contribution from, from China contribute to the world, to the control of COVID-19 globally. Look back at the initial stage of outbreak, two important bottlenecks. One is uh, a hospital bed, because in such a short time, larger number of patients concentrate in the clinic cannot be admitted to the heart. The patient's brain is either indicated among our patients or spread among family members. Hospital beds become critical but lax control the epidemic. Second is capacity to prove diagnosis. In order to response to this outbreak, China uses control elements that include universal elements, including mask wearing and wearing Second, case application, isolation, and management. So we to quickly diagnose the cases and isolate them from the community, from the family member, in order to stop transmission. Number three, close contact application and quarantine. Some of the close contacts will be infected. If we do not detect them uh, in the early stage, they may cause the continued spreading among the community. So the contact quarantine is quickly important to stop the epidemic. Suspend the rules and number five. The epidemic movement. movement. No movement, no pandemic. Movement restriction is very important to the transmission. Differentiation of levels of care and isolation for a high risk group or people specific, we identify five categories. Close contactors, they may infected, may not infected. So those close contactors needed to be quarantined in home or hotel. In the early initial response, we encourage people, people close contact use home quarantine. Later on, we find it's not a good idea because home quarantine cannot guarantee close contactors does not have the contact with other family members. Then we changed our strategy, use a designated hotel for concentrate quarantine. The second category is suspected cases. Some may infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, some may not. They may just uh, a flu or pneumonia. And also we made a mistake in the early uh, response. We put suspected cases more than one in, in one world. That's not right thing because some infected, some not infected, that will cause contamination or spreading among uh, suspected uh, patients in the same world. The number three, it's uh, mild or moderate cases. They infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, but their symptoms are mild or moderate. So they do not need sophisticated care. So most of them only need uh, 
some care. So they were put in the Fontan Shad Hospital. The number four is a severe case. The number five is a critical case. So this two category, they need sophisticated health care. The large proportion of cases consist by mild or moderate cases account for about 80% of total diagnosis cases. Now, move to slide number six, Fan Chang Shad Hospital. That's a very important uh, innovation of new idea, create a Shad Hospital is very important to uh, respond to this outbreak. The Shad Hospital have five functions. The number one, isolation. That's the most important function. Isolation of milder, moderate cases is important to the transmission. Number two, charge. Number three, better supportive medical care. Dealing military referral. That's very important to uh, monitor the patient's uh, uh, symptoms. Because we advanced to advance the to the why exactly a common and the sexual engagement. The technology of the the so it matches Because more you not need to take the care, so only need a small number of care provide, not a number of to just out of pay. Because so many patients in the AS privacy guarantee and also cannot eat. Individual demands, however, hospital for the innovation to response to the outbreak. That's play a critical role in control. Okay, I continue. Proceed, please. Okay, thank you. Now it's okay, thank you. Now Yes. So the slide number nine update the epidemic of COVID-19 in China by June 28th. So the major outbreak was brought under control, only takes about two months. Then we have imported the cases for about two months, 
suddenly in the middle of June, unexpected outbreak occurred in Beijing. Again, it is not from a market. It's uh, very similar to the original outbreak in Wuhan seafood market there. So we try to identify what's the cause for this outbreak in Beijing. So we worked very hard from epidemiology, from environment, from virology, from a different perspective, trying to understand how this happened. So far, we have not identified what's the source of this outbreak. It's still a mystery. We try to get an answer. It's very important. It now occurred in Beijing. Could it be occurred next in Shanghai or in the other city? So we work very hard. We hope we will get an answer. By now, we have totally reported confirmed cases at 3,512 and uh, suspected cases 10. We have also PCR positive 6,707. We have total days 4,634. The uh, crude, the case fatality ratio 5.5%. Next slide is number 10. So the slide number 10 summarizes lessons we had that include science-driven response, as I described in the initial uh, earlier event, the four scientific uh, contribution that's very important to develop a uh, control strategy. The number two, core traditional public health measures that include mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing. Number three, critical bottleneck, positioning and settlement. That is hospital bed capacity and capacity for testing. Number four, community mobilization and response. Respond to COVID-19, it's a uh, for the people, by the people, with our community engagement, it's very hard to win the battle. The number five, transparent public uh, communication. From the initial response, Chinese government, scientists are transparent to uh, share information with international community, with the community in the China. That's very important for public to understand what's going on and to get their trust, to get their uh, support. The number six, international cooperation. The number seven, leadership, coordination, and cooperation. The number eight, stronger logistic support. All these eight lessons is very important. And uh, use these uh, eight lessons, we brought the epidemic under control. We will use this to respond to the future epidemic. And look at that eight experience could be divided by the four category. One is uh, uh, four defense lines. In the initial stage, we treat response to the epidemic as a war. So we set our first defense line, Wuhan and Hubei, the second defense line, Beijing. The third defense line, Hubei's surrounding region. The fourth defense line, nationwide. The four earliest is very important. Early detection, early reporting, early isolation, and early treatment. Even a single case could cause an outbreak. So early identification of cases and uh, to control, to making sure the patient cannot continue to spread the virus is critically important. Uh, yeah, Dr. Wu, and, so because of time, yeah. so I would like to wrap up I'm in, in, two, in two minutes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. almost two finished. Minutes. Okay. Yeah, the community engagement is very important and the resource allocation. 
So all the response that we based on the signs, we have two uh, important uh, technical guidelines, diagnostic treatment protocol and prevention and control protocol. All these protocols updated very quickly. You can see the interval uh, for updating the longest is only uh, 15 days, about two weeks. The shortest, only a week, seven, uh, six days. So this means as long as accumulated knowledge, we immediately use that knowledge to guide our response. Now our strategy is to focus on prevention control, uh, imported cases that including create no gap chain from border to community to the home. So at entry point, we have a screening strategy, then we have quarantine policy for travelers. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wu. Right, yeah, sorry, there was the, uh, some uh, connection difficulties in, in the middle. So thank you for your comprehensive presentation. The shelter hospital is a good example of swift response to a massive surge of patients. The eight lessons learned and key experiences further provide important references on the holistic approach to fight the virus. For our next speaker, we have Dr. Oshitani Hitoshi, professor of Tohoku University. Dr. Oshitani leads the implementation of the uh, cluster-based approach in response to COVID-19 in Japan. He also played a key role as a regional advisor at WHO Western Pacific Regional Office in the fight against SARS. Dr. Oshitani, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, I also would like to thank for organizer uh, for inviting me, me for this uh, important uh, webinar. And uh, it's my great pleasure and the great honor to share our experience with you. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we are using quite unique approach for COVID-19, uh, which is called as uh, the cluster-based approach. And uh, this approach is based on our epidemiological finding. So I would like to explain what we've been doing uh, for COVID-19 in Japan. So can I have a, my first slide, please? Okay, next one, please. So COVID-19 and SARS are caused by similar virus, the similar uh, coronavirus, but um, epidemiologically, the SARS and the COVID-19 are quite different. They're also clinically, these two diseases are quite different. Uh, one of the most important differences between SARS and COVID-19 is the clinical severity. The for SARS, most of infected individuals had very severe illness, and the case fatality ratio was quite high. But uh, compared to SARS, the COVID-19 is the quite different, and uh, many infected individuals they are having just mild illness or the even asymptomatic the infection, which means the infected individual that do not have any symptoms. So these characteristics of the COVID-19 that make this virus very difficult to control. But the, another important epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19 is the, 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 it's shown in the, the graph below. The, the left below is uh, the how many people are infected the, from one infected individual. And uh, actually for COVID-19, most of, of infected individuals do not pass the virus to anybody else. Nearly 80% of them do not infect others. But uh, 
only small portion of infected individual infect many others and causing the quite big the super spreading event or the large clusters. This characteristic is similar to SARS. The, the also for SARS, the many infected individuals the, did not pass the virus to anybody else. And a very small portion of uh, infected individual passed the virus to many others. So this epidemiological characteristics of the COVID-19 the need us led us to develop our the cluster based approach the next slide please so due to this characteristic of covid 19 the without cluster or the super spreading event the transmission cannot be sustained so this is a the quite different from the, the infectious disease like influenza. For influenza, the many infected individuals the infect others. The, but uh, for COVID-19, if we do not have a cluster, the transmission chain cannot be sustained. So, so the cluster approach, we believe that uh, the preventing the cluster, especially in the early phase of outbreak, that can result in suppression of the virus. That's uh, the scientific basis for the, our the cluster-based approach. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, to identify cluster, the, we are using the quite unique the contact tracing strategy. I understand in many countries. Uh, they are only doing so-called prospective contact tracing, which means uh, beginning with the newly confirmed cases, the close contacts are identified and followed. Uh, we are also uh, conducting the, this, the prospective contact tracing, but in addition to prospective, prospective contact tracing, we are also uh, doing uh, retrospective contact tracing, uh, which means that uh, the, the past activities of infected individuals are investigated in order to identify the common sources of infection. So, so this, the, the retrospective contact tracing can identify the infections more efficiently than the, the, the strictly prospective contact tracing. The, and the, this approach enables us the more effective control of the COVID-19. Next slide, please. So by analyzing many clusters, the, by the, using the retrospective contact tracing, that we managed to identify the many, many clusters. The, so by analyzing these clusters, the, we found common characteristics the, for the clusters. And uh, the most important common characteristics of the majority of clusters are summarized as a three Cs, uh, which means the closed, closed space, crowded places, and the closed contact setting. So, now we call this as a sanmitsu in Japan, and even small children know this word. And uh, we managed to uh, send more effective messages uh, to avoid the risky behavior to the general public. And uh, also further analysis of the, the clusters identify additional the risk factors, such as uh, the exercise, the talking in loud voice, singing, and nightlife setting. So the nightlife setting is uh, currently the major the source of infection in Tokyo and other places in Japan. The next slide, please. 
So this is the epidemiology of COVID-19 in Japan from January to June. Uh, initially, we had uh, the smaller outbreak uh, between January and uh, the mid-March, which was uh, caused by imported cases, uh, mainly from China. But uh, uh, since the mid-March, we had increasing number of cases, suddenly increasing number of cases, uh, due to imported cases uh, from many different countries, uh, including European countries, the United States, Southeast Asian countries, and others. And that's why we had a very, uh, quite big outbreak uh, from March to May. And the uh, state of emergency was declared uh, on the 7th of April. But uh, we managed to suppress the transmission uh, from uh, since early April. And uh, the state of emergency was lifted on the 25th of May. But uh, this virus is very, very difficult to contain. And uh, that we are still having the sporadic cases. And now we are facing to the new challenges, uh, the, which is uh, increasing number of cases associated, especially associated with nightlife, uh, and uh, particularly in Tokyo. And uh, we are trying to the, the control these uh, outbreak associated with the night drive. And uh, we also are having uh, many the hospital outbreaks and the nursing home outbreaks. And uh, in these settings, many elderly people are living. So that's why we are seeing the many severe cases and the deaths in these settings. And we are also trying to develop the new strategy to avoid the such transmission to the hospital or nursing the home settings. And we are using the new technology, the, including uh, the mobile phone app and uh, other technology like uh, the, the rapid uh, diagnostic test. And the next slide, please. So this is the, the comparison of uh, the COVID-19 deaths and the deaths per uh, 100,000 population in the, the G20 countries. As you can see, the China, Republic of Korea, and the Japan are at the bottom the, in terms of uh, the mortality impact. And uh, the, these three countries are using the different approaches, but uh, we, are, the, we, we have been successful in suppressing the, the transmission of the COVID-19 in these three countries. And I believe that uh, the, it is important to share our experiences uh, to uh, fight against this virus uh, in coming months or the probably coming years. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oshitani. Indeed, identifying the virus's characteristic mode of transmission is crucial to suppress further spread. Specifically, Japan's cluster-based approach and the concept of three Cs offer valuable experiences to other countries to contain the virus effectively. Now, uh, may I introduce Dr. Yi Hyung Min, professor of Yonsei University, who has been emphasizing the need for long-term preparedness against COVID-19. Dr. Yi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, my name is Hyung Min Ri and work for several hospital as a rep physician who majoring in clinical microbiology. Uh, I'm now reading COVID-19 test course in Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine. Uh, please uh, share my slide, please. Uh, uh, it's my honor to be invited to, to this meaningful webinar. Uh, for sharing Korean experience for diagnostic system for COVID-19. Uh, as all of you know, uh, we have many uh, valuable uh, experience like the uh, driver through system or uh, IT tracking system, but 
uh, I don't have uh, enough time, so I'd like to concentrate my uh, presentation to diagnostic system in South Korea. As we all know well, uh, as we all know well now, uh, COVID-19 is caused by novel coronavirus called the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is named after SARS coronavirus due to genetic similarity. Uh, regarding the origin of this novel virus, uh, there are so many assumptions, but uh, we don't have a correct answer for the origin uh, of this virus until now. However, uh, one bad coronavirus, which was reported, reported in 2017, uh, showed 97% uh, of genetic similarity, and it is assumed that SARS-CoV-2 may be evolved from the common ancestor of this virus, called the RATG13. Next, please. After the first report of the COVID-19, uh, it became a, a pandemic in three months. Uh, currently, more than 10 million people have been suffered from this novel infection, and more than a half of a million uh, infected cases uh, died. In South Korea, uh, we suffered from large outbreak by Shincheonji Church in Daegu in February, but we could overcome that outbreak and South Korea ranks uh, 140% uh, when we compare the prevalence per million people. In the process of overcoming the crisis, many things were important, including strong and transparent leadership of government in Korean CDC, and cutting HIV technology for patient tracking, and commitment from dedicated medical staff, and spontaneous major citizens, and so on. However, one of the most important factors is diagnostic system and capacity in South Korea. So I'd like to uh, share our experience in this aspect. Next, please. Uh, all of the previous speakers said, uh, like all of uh, the previous speakers said, uh, this notorious disease can be impacted from asymptomatic patient or pre-symptomatic patient and, and the rate of asymptomatic infection can be as high as 40 to 50 percent. According, according to Aaron's report in the uh, United States, uh, about uh, 60 percent of patients can be asymptomatic at the time of detection, and about 90 percent of patients can be converted into symptomatic patients in two days, but remain the 10 percent to keep their asymptomatic status until they recover. And both asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic patients can transmit their COVID-19 to other persons. Another characteristic of COVID-19 is very mild symptom, even in symptomatic patients. In early stage of COVID-19 pandemic, high body temperature, sore throat, and shortness of breath are well known as a, a triad, well known triad to suspect COVID-19. However, uh, it was reported that only 10 to 20 percent of patients may show these symptoms, and most of patients can show uh, only very mild symptoms. So, screening of COVID-19 by symptom is very difficult, and all of these transmission can be happened in very early stage of uh, uh, stage by drumly transmission. Next, please. Uh, because of these characteristics of COVID-19 in transmission, uh, it's harder to screen by symptom in community. So, uh, the only way to uh, detect patient is massive screening by epidemiological tracking. This is very important point. Next, please. So, South Korean CDC decided to carry out uh, three main components to contain COVID-19 in South Korea, including massive diagnostic testing, isolation and treatment, and finally tracking. All these three components should be performed like a chain. A diagnostic testing find the patient, and all patients should be isolated for treatment and prevention of transmission. And we find that epidemiologically related contact person to screen the COVID-19 by tracking. And all closed contact personnel should be tested for COVID-19, whether or not they had the symptoms, because about a half of a patient can be asymptomatic. To support this chain, we should establish the diagnostic system for COVID-19 under the concept of early implementation, maximum capacity for massive testing, exact testing, and rapid turnaround time. Next, please. 
Next, please. Uh, all uh, this POC uh, concept, uh, early implementation from early implementation to uh, uh, exact testing, uh, is very important to contain the COVID 19 successfully. Uh, because the transmit surveillance, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, all of these concepts are very important, but early implementation of a nationwide diagnostic system is the most important point to contain the COVID 19 successfully. Because the transmissibility of COVID-19 is so strong, so the number of patients can be doubled in every, every three to seven days according to each country's situations. Uh, January 12th is the day when the first COVID-19 patients were confirmed in South Korea. So let's assume that we have 10 undiagnosed patients at that day. 10 patients can be uh, 160 after one month if we adjust IL note from Chinese data, and this size of a patient can be managed. However, after another month, 160 patients can be uh, uh, 2,560. And since the, uh, and uh, since this March 12th, uh, 366 new patients can be happened every day. This size of COVID-19 burden cannot be managed by completely. But some of the transmission can be controlled by routine tests and epidemic comp can be decreased. But after three months later, uh, since the first uh, COVID-19 patient was diagnosed, you may have uh, 40,000 of COVID-19 patients and about 6,000 new patients uh, can be detected in every day. In this time, it is impossible to contain COVID-19 by ordinary activity, and the only way to prevent from the spreading of COVID-19 is lockdown. So we should establish diagnostic system for massive COVID-19 testing as soon as possible. Next, please. This slide shows the result of our struggle to establish diagnostic system in Korea quickly. Uh, it is difficult to screen the patient by symptoms. So, massive diagnostic testing capacity is required to detect COVID-19 infection. Before February 7th, only 18 public laboratory uh, controlled by Korean cities can test COVID-19. And the number of available tests may be 2,000 per day at the time. Since February 7th, 25 private laboratories started to perform the COVID-19 testing, and the capacity for COVID-19 testing expanded from 2,000 to uh, 10,000 per day. Uh, the capacity of 10,000 is added over the uh, 2,000 in public laboratory system and 8,000 in private laboratory system. We continue our struggle to increase rep capacity for COVID-19 and we can or uh, about the uh, 60,000 COVID-19 tests per day uh, we can do on uh, June 1st. Uh, June 1st, uh, we can do the COVID-19 testing in about the uh, 55, uh, 55,000 tests in private area and 5,000 tests in public areas. Next slide, please. And this slide shows the capacity and the number of tests during February in South Korea. Uh, February 18th was the day when the first patient was uh, diagnosed, diagnosed, uh, diagnosed, and this patient was belonged to Sinchonji Church. After that, the number of tests dramatically increased, and we also tried to expand our capacity along this incredible test, and we are uh, successful to our, uh, in expanding our capacity and diagnosed many patients in Sinchonji uh, during the Sinchonji outbreaks. Next slide, please. And the third important concept is exact test. Generally speaking, uh, three kinds of testing methods can be used to detect COVID-19. But molecular diagnosis is the most accurate and uh, can detect asymptomatic patient. So we decided to use only molecular diagnosis uh, after expert meeting uh, consisting of Korean CDC and Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine. Next slide, please. Uh, in many countries, 
uh, they would like, they want to use the antibody test because the antibody test can be done easily by forms of the self-testing. However, the sensitivity of antibody test is as low as 60% in seven days after symptom onset. And this period is the time when the infectivity is very strong. So the first negative in this period is very critical to contain the COVID-19. So Korean CDC made a notice of emergency use authorization only for molecular diagnosis. So currently, only molecular diagnosis is used to detect COVID-19 in South Korea. Next, please. After all of this process, uh, we finally have two laboratory networks. One is the uh, private laboratory, private or clinical laboratory network, and another is a public laboratory networks. Uh, clinical private laboratory network is managed by the Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine. And this network is consisting of a secondary or tertiary care hospital and some clinical laboratory centers. And this system can handle the uh, 50, uh, 5,000 tests uh, a day. And turnaround time put uh, in this network is about the 3 to 24 hours. And most of the tests can be reported in 6 to uh, 12 hours. Another uh, laboratory network is public laboratory network. This network is managed by the Center for Laboratory Control of Infectious Diseases in KCDC. And this network is consisting of Center for Laboratory Control of Infectious Diseases in KCDC and Research Institute of Health and Environment. And uh, this network can handle the 3,000 to 4,000 tests per day. And uh, this uh, network also can, re can report the result in 3 to 24 hours. So most of uh, COVID-19 tests can be reported in within 24 hours in South Korea. Next, please. To establish this Korean laboratory network, we must overcome some problems, including lack of positive control and so on. These problems were overcome uh, through cooperation between Korean CDC and Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine. For example, external quality assurance is very important to, uh, uh, point to assure the rep quality. For uh, external quality assurance, Korean cities made positive control material, and this EQA was done by network on the collaboration of academic society, like a Korean Society of Laboratory Medicine and Korean Association of Quality Assurance for Clinical Laboratory. This both uh, society is belonged to uh, academic society in South Korea. Next slide, please. Another example of uh, public private collaboration is the emergency use authorization process for diagnostic testing kits. To establish the diagnostic system for novel infectious disease uh, with various hospital, the development of standardized commercial diagnostic testing kits is, is essential. In early stages of emerging infectious disease, but positive control or clinical sample for evaluation is very limited. So, in South Korea, the evaluation for diagnostic testing kit have been performed by several laboratories, including one public and four private laboratories, using limited number of clinical specimens to maximize the accuracy of diagnostic testing kits during the EUA process. And oh, the only testing kits uh, show the uh, same result by all laboratories uh, is get the uh, emergency use authorization. So only one test case was get the emergency use authorization in early stage of uh, COVID-19 response in South Korea. Next slide, please. Uh, through this process, uh, Korea has been able to uh, build uh, inspection capabilities, but uh, these logistical uh, diagnostic uh, capabilities is not available in all countries and or environment. So in countries with insufficient molecular diagnostic capabilities, capacities, COVID-19 infections may increase. And in this setting, 
it is very important to develop a diagnostic strategy that matches the characteristics of each countries. So in countries low molecular testing capacity, uh, if they if they have the antibody testing capacity and then they can use the uh, initial uh, antibody testing kit as a screening test. And in the case, the molecular diagnostic testing can be used as a confirmatory or uh, antibody negative cases. And mass screening or pooling study also can be used in this uh, low molecular testing capacity settings. And another good choice for low molecular uh, testing capacity settings is the antigen testing. Even though we don't have the uh, reliable antigen uh, testing kits now, but antigen testing kits uh, show the uh, good specificity. So because if the antigen testing kit is developed and then we can use it uh, very efficiently. Next slide, please. And this strategy may be also developed by transmission scenarios, like the WHO uh, strategy rec recommended strategies. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my conclusion. COVID-19 can easily spread in community by asymptomatic infection. And three cycle for COVID-19 containment is very important because it is difficult to screen the patient by symptoms. And the two complete this uh, three cycle, early implementation and expansion of co-festive COVID-19 diagnostic testing is very essential. And to make the this uh, diagnostic uh, system, collaboration of private and public health system is very uh, required to establish the rare capacity. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. We appreciate your in-depth analysis on the diagnostic system for COVID-19. Indeed, the three T's, testing, treatment, tracking, are key to the containment of COVID-19. The early implementation of nation, nationwide massive testing in Korea was particularly impressive. So last but not least, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Kasai Takeshi, Regional Director of WHO Office for Western Pacific. Dr. Kasai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your invitations. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, provide you a brief, brief update on the COVID-19 situations and how we are responding to it. May I have our first slide, please? Can I have a next slide, please? If you could go back uh, one slide backwards, thank you very much. The uh, number of reported confirmed COVID-19 cases from the world continue to rise, and we've reached the green milestone of 10 million people infected and half a million lives lost worldwide. The pandemic is now hitting lower resources countries with fragile health system that are less equipped to contain the virus. Infections are accelerating in many parts of the world. Next slide, please. If we see this uh, by a six WHO region, while European uh, regions, and then now uh, maybe Eastern Mediterranean re regions, uh, downward or at least plateau, three other regions showing increasing a trend. In the Western Pacific region, most countries are seeing case numbers stabilize or decline. Some have had no new infections over a month, but there are countries with areas where we have observing ongoing outbreak or cluster. Although the number in the Western Pacific are smaller than other regions, the impact of this pandemic has been huge 
for families, societies, and economies, and people are anxious and fatigued. So far, countries in the Western Pacific region is suppressing the infection. We can't put our arms down. We still have a plenty of space for virus to spread in the regions and around the world. And in this interconnected world, as long as the virus is circulating somewhere, no country is safe. We must stay vigilant and keep preparing for further surge of the virus. Next slide, please. WHO role uh, in infectious diseases is defined in the International Health Regulation. Current International Health Regulation, IHR, is revised based on the lesson learned from SARS in 2003. The countries are mandated to share information of the event that can pose threat to international community and WHO is expected to facilitate that. It was originally uh, information on virus, but we quickly uh, noticed that not just information on the virus, but information on intervention is equally important. We have uh, been uh, connecting member states and has been organizing regular session for facilitating sharing experience on response. We are also coordinating the research and development, including solidarity trial. Supporting countries, those who need help, is one of the most important functions of WHO. Based on those information we collected, and based on our experience and knowledge on the countries, we have been developing the guidance tailored to our region. And we are supporting countries in developing response plan, establishing testing and surveillance system, contact tracing, healthcare pathway, communication, and community engagement based on the guidance we received from our technical advisory group in the past. We are actually also doing something we have never experienced in the past outbreak response, fight with misinformation. The rumor is spreading much faster than the virus, and we're trying to work with the member states, countries, and partners to make sure that the people have access to right information. And because of the global gross shortage of the personal protective equipment, test kit, etc., we are also facilitating delivering those equipment to the countries. And so far, we deliver a PPE of 22 tons of 20 to 24 countries and testing kit to 10 countries in the region. We are doing this in partnership and China, Japan, Korea has been a strong supporter for this. Next slide, please. Why our region has been able to suppress these uh, infections? We have been looking for any intervention that is contributing or any factor. It is very important questions, we know, to find a way to prevent the further spread. And three countries, China, Japan, and Korea, experiences has been studied by many countries. But we found it is not that simple questions to identify the answer. Every country has a different background. In fact, our region is one of the most diverse regions covering Mongolia in the north, New Zealand in the south, and French Polynesia in the east, and China in the west. Perhaps it's not a single intervention, but we think it's a bundle of intervention that makes uh, differences. And those are <clears throat> public health intervention, including identifying the case and contact tracing, healthcare pathway to manage those uh, cases and the uh, uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases identified through the contact tracing, early non-pharmaceutical intervention, communications and effort to engage community, command and whole government approach, and also connecting a central uh, and a local government to enhance this multi-sectoral approach. Next slide, please. One of the characteristics of this region is many countries introduce so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as restricting the mass gathering or physical distancing or restriction of the movement control relatively early. This is a new virus, so we still don't know how each of those interventions being effective. But what I can say is that without these certain interventions, we might have experienced much bigger number of infections, and there might be more countries experiencing hospital overwhelming. But at the same time, 
we've been observing that significant impact of a society life and economy, particularly family and individual in the uh, poor, uh, poverty. We have to find a way to do this uh, better. Next slide, please. When we, next slide, please. When we think about the long-term strategy, obviously one important step is to continue to strengthen healthcare capacity and public health capacity and to pay attention how to protect the vulnerable. And the other is continue to adjust those non-pharmaceutical intervention according to epidemiological situations. And when we think how to live with this virus, I think it is a mistake to prioritizing either health or livelihoods. It's actually about improving both. And decision about how to do this in different contexts need to be based on the data, and they need to be made by bringing together the health sector, economic sector, and community at one table. The key is individual willingness to maintain healthy practices to protect not only themselves, but their families, colleagues, particularly the vulnerable, including the healthcare worker. The key is business sector to find a way to operate to minimize the risk of infection. And the key is the government to develop the policy and implement the policy to support the individual and business sectors. Next slide, please. If we do this well, we can protect ourselves and each other from these diseases but also other threats. We can grow from the new normal to a new future where health is recognized as an investment, where healthy people in our communities achieve their full potential and where inequalities are minimized. This is good for all of us as individuals, but also for our economies and societies. This new future, is the dividend of COVID-19, which WHO hopes for, hopes for, and looking forward to working together with the partners and member states. We are now at the decisive moment. We must stay vigilant and keep preparing for further surges of the virus so that together we make our way to this better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kasai. There's certainly WHO plays an important coordinating role in COVID-19 response, especially on technical cooperation and facilitating information sharing among countries. The fight against the virus is going to be a long battle, and we are, we are all have, uh, have the responsibility to make our societies and health systems stronger to create a better future. Thank you all for your presentation. And now shifting gear at this point, we move on to the Q&A session. So Secretary General Michigami, please like to ask, uh, like, uh, to ask you to take a lead. Thank you, Excellency. So let us now move on to the Q&A session. We have received over 300 questions from many countries. Thank you so much. And here I'd like your understandings that due to time constraints, we cannot address all of them. I will group them into six to seven questions. And here, uh, in addition to the three panelists, we have Dr. Wang Kui Chang, uh, Director of Infectious Disease Department, Peking University, First Hospital. So, so let's go let's on go to on the to uh, first question. This is for Dr. Oshitani and Dr. Lee. In many countries, medical standards are not as high as China, Japan, or Korea. These countries are suffering a lot. So can you give advice to these developing countries or low income countries where health system and economic basis are relatively weak. 
uh, in these countries, they don't have many hospitals or doctors, and perhaps their sanitary standards are not good enough. So I'd like you uh, to give them a helpful or re realistic advice. I don't know, mask wearing or social distancing or whatever. So first, Dr. Oshitani, can you try to answer? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, it's very difficult uh, question to answer. The, 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 I know that uh, many resource limited countries are experiencing uh, the very difficult situations. And uh, but um, therefore, the key success, the success, the for Japan's success that depends on uh, the good healthcare system. Uh, we have a good healthcare system and almost everyone can uh, the access to the good healthcare system. That's why uh, we managed to uh, identify at least most of severe cases uh, without the huge uh, PCR capacity. Uh, we've been very cautious in expanding the, the PCR capacity the, because of uh, the quality of testing and other issues. But uh, now that we are expanding the, the PCR capacity, but uh, the, in the initial stage, we have a very limited uh, PCR capacity, but uh, the still we managed to identify the, the majority of severe cases, the, the thanks to the, 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 this good uh, healthcare system. And so uh, these countries, these countries with limited resources, the need to further the invest the into the, the healthcare system. And, uh, and also the, there is no the one size fit type of approach for this virus. And uh, every country is uh, using the different approaches. The, the, the China, Japan, Korea are using the different approaches. And the different countries are having the different settings, the different situations in terms of the epidemiology. So uh, they probably need the, the the different the strategies for this virus, and uh, that we are happy to, to help these countries to, to provide some advice based on our, our, our the experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, then uh, Dr. Lee, please. Yeah. Uh, first, I agree with this. Uh, some different strategies should be applied, uh, especially in the diagnostic strategy by each country's situation. And uh, epidemiological tracing, but epidemiological tracing is particularly important to determine the subject of testing. And also isolation is one of the main tools to contain the COVID-19. And then diagnostic strategy is uh, important. But diagnostic strategy, uh, strategy may be difficult according to uh, the capacity for molecular diagnosis. So uh, in low molecular diagnostic capacity, Initial screening can be done by antibody test, even though they have low sensitivity. But uh, to save the molecular capacity, <coughs> antibody testing uh, can be used. And, and, and antibody negative subject can be tested by molecular testings. And another solution may be the fling test. Uh, fling test can be uh, used for developing countries. In South Korea, fling technique is also used for mass screening in some hospital or long-term care facilities after validation by our uh, clinical society. And uh, we use it uh, without the loss of sensitivity in mass screening. So I don't know the exact, what is the exact answer because the, everybody have, have their situations. So uh, in each country, they should uh, develop their strategy. Mm. That's my answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanya and Dr. Lee. Uh, question number two. This is for Dr. Wang, Dr. Ostani, and Dr. Lee. Uh, China, Japan, and Korea have much smaller number of deaths and effect, infection cases. Some people say that in East Asia, there, are, there is a factor independent of government measures. And some call this factor 
as factor x. So the question is, what will the factor x be? I know you experts and your governments have been doing all good jobs in three countries. I agree, and, and, and many people will agree. But I also think that there are some other factors other than government measures. Uh, for example, high hygienic standards or social discipline or some cultural practices. For example, in East Asian countries, we don't often hug or kiss. We have maybe smaller uh, number of family gathering compared in compared with Europe or Latin American countries or Middle Eastern countries, or some uh, mention BCG, BCG uh, vaccination. So can you try to explain what this factor will be? First, Dr. Wang, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, join this uh, webinar. This question is very interesting. I think uh, for China, Japan, and Korea, so all these are good uh, basis of the healthcare system is important, I think. Besides the uh, government measures uh, you mentioned a lot, I think it's a culture, I think. It's, uh, uh, the first of all is uh, the people's compliance for is good, it's good enough in uh, these three countries. For example, the government uh, asked the people to get the, take the mask and the, the, the social distance, uh, hand hygiene, and uh, uh, stay at home for isolation, etc. All these measures have been in these three countries. I think this is the first thing. And the second thing, I, I think this uh, the about this uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, customs the uh, the these three countries they didn't gather in very, together very often at this uh, specific situation they just stayed at home in China all the people stay home uh, isolate them, themselves this is a uh, uh, important issue <clears throat> and another one is uh, I think is uh, all the expertise uh, uh, mentioned about is uh, the case tracing, contact tracing. This is kind of for government measures, but this these measures has been uh, uh, implemented very seriously. This is another important part. Just mentioned yesterday, uh, WHO mentioned about uh, case tracing is uh, very important to to find the uh, uh, infection patients and uh, isolate them and uh, keep the uh, uh, transmission stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ostani, please. Yes, the, this is a new virus and uh, there are still many unknowns and uh, there could be many, the, some important factors uh, the, which are not known, but uh, uh, which are associated with uh, the, the relative success in uh, these three countries. And we have to explore uh, many different possibilities and uh, social, cultural, and the behavioral aspect uh, may be important. Uh, we uh, declared the state of emergency, but uh, the, all the physical distancing measures the, were the, the voluntary basis. We did not the force the people to stay home, and but uh, it's a voluntary basis. And uh, we also did not force to close the shops, restaurants, and uh, it's again uh, the voluntary basis. But uh, the in Japan, the 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 majority of people the the implement the the right the 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 measures the to the avoid the transmission. And uh, this kind of aspect in uh, the, this part of the world, uh, that may be important. And uh, we also need to explore the, some other possibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And Dr. Lee, please. I'm so sorry. I don't know why my mic is muted. Uh, I agree with uh, my previous uh, speaker's opinion. Uh, some people say that uh, BCG vaccination may be factor X, but I don't know. But mm. however, uh, rapid detection and early treatment uh, seems to be associated with good prognosis according to our experience because the, the total death rate is very rate in South Korea. And also the death rate in each age group is also very lower than other countries. So we think the rapid detection and early treatment may be associated with the good prognosis. In South Korea, most of COVID-19 patients have been diagnosed within two to four days after symptom onset. And so most, so most of Korean patients can be treated as soon as possible after symptom onset. So I think that this rapid uh, diagnosis and uh, start of a treatment may be a role in decreased uh, mortality. Yeah, that's my uh, opinion. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee, Dr. Lee. Uh, next question, question number three. Uh, this is a relatively quick question and answer for, again, I'm sorry, for Dr. Oshitani. Both Japan and Korea had been managing the pandemic relatively well without lockdown measures, but the two countries took different strategies for the PCR virus testing. In Japan, you have low rate of testing. In Korea, you have relatively high rate of testing. How do you see this difference, Dr. Ustani? Thank you very much. The the, the again the as I said uh, before the the we are using the different strategies uh, mm -hmm. the in terms of uh, testing and other measures and uh, there is no the one size fit mm -hmm. all type of uh, the, the the solution for this virus and uh, we had uh, the limited the PCR capacity but uh, we needed to develop the effective uh, the control measure the based on the available the the resources mm -hmm. and uh, every country have to the the try to develop the best strategy the based on available resources and uh, our the the solution the for the testing is the the Although we had a limited uh, the PCR capacity at the beginning, the, we the managed to the, the identify the the, uh, the cluster, to develop the cluster-based approach, which does not need the the massive mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. uh, without massive testing, we can manage to, to identify the many cases. So the, the different we, we have a different approaches, but uh, the all countries are trying the best. Uh, to minimize the impact, and uh, the three, at least uh, the, so far, these three countries are uh, being uh, successful in the suppressing the, the the virus transmission by using the different strategies. Thank you, Dr. Oshani. So, Dr. Lee, do you have something you want to add or respond? <laughs> uh, it's it's very difficult because the doctor, uh, like the doctor was. Is, uh, opinion that every country has its uh, own uh, situations. So in our country, we have uh, we can uh, make the diagnostic system as soon as possible, so we can use it to mm -hmm. find the many patient. But mm -hmm. the post outbreak setting is very different between two countries. We faced the large outbreak in Sinchonji Church in Daegu in mm -hmm. early stage of. Uh, mm -hmm in South Korea in early stage. And then our ref, uh, big, uh, big capacity for rapid di uh, diagnostic testing is, is make a crucial role in that stage. But in Japan, uh, they faced another situation. So I don't know what is the difference between the two countries. But our diagnostic capacity is very important to uh, point in our country's situations. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes, indeed. Thank you very much, two doctors.
And next question, question four. Uh, let me welcome one participant from the Philippines to, to ask a question. This will be for Dr. Wang and Dr. Li. So please. Okay. Um, the Philippines just recorded the highest new cases in the past weeks after we released social and economic restraints, and we haven't flattened the curve. I think many countries are in similar situations. Uh, can you give some more suggestions or advice to developing countries like ours? Okay, thank you very much for your very important and uh, succinct question. Yes, indeed, many countries are facing this difficult situation now. And maybe China, Japan, Korea are not the exception. So how to balance between protecting people's life and economic activities. So we have to open the door and close the door again and open or tighten the restraint and loosen, we have to repeat the same thing. So first, uh, Dr. Wang, can you answer this question? Okay. Um, thank you the, for the question. It's uh, all we face the similar things. Uh, I, I don't think it's of a shortcut to, to prevent the pandemic. Uh, uh, and the uh, COVID-19 uh, infection should be a uh, normalized life sta status. So for prevent the spreading and the outbreak, I think uh, first of all, we should uh, to keep the, the measures, all the measures, including the wearing the mask, these are uh, the long di uh, uh, social distance and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the uh, uh, hydrants, hands, hydrants, etc. All this is important to prevent transmission so far. And uh, uh, and the second thing, I, uh, in my opinion, there's the early fighting and early diagnosis for all for the cases. See, the early fighting, early diagnosis depends on the uh, the detection. The nuclear acid detection is very important. A key issue to uh, to prevent the transmission and outbreak. And another thing I think is the uh, the case tracing. The case tracing is sometimes difficult to to uh, to do, but you have to do this uh, case tracing very seriously and get the, the contact, close contact patients, uh, pe people's isolated uh, effectively. So this is the way to, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the so-called common situation of the even the returning the business and the working you have to take. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wan and Dr. Lee, please. Sorry to ask you so many questions. <laughs> I don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry for the Philippines situation, um, but in my thought, I also think there, there is no sure cause to make the epidemiological problem flattened. Uh, each country has responded to COVID-19 using many methods, but uh, the method can be divided into two categories. One is the massive testing and isolation, and another is lockdown. I don't know which method is more uh, appropriate for your countries, but you should choose uh, each of one. And another important strategy is mass masking. Over 50% of COVID-19 patients may be asymptomatic. So, mass masking is very important too to stop the spreading of COVID-19 from asymptomatic patient. So, I would like to recommend the mass masking for Philippines. Okay, thank you very much for two doctors. Uh, next question, uh, question number five. This is for Dr. Wu Tsunyo and Dr. Ustani. When does the next big wave come? And when will an effective vaccine be available? Simple but 
important question. We've received this question uh, from so many participants. So can you first try uh, Dr. Wang, sorry, Dr. Wu. Thank you for that question. Uh, in terms of second wave, actually globally, we are still in the first wave. It's still a uh, epidemic uh, picket. It's continue to increase. So each day we have over uh, 100 thousands of new cases infected. It's only a few countries brought the epidemic under control, such as China, Japan, Korea. When all of three countries talk about second wave, that's possible. And for the other countries, the epidemic are ongoing. Are ongoing. So the epidemic could be uh, get even worse if you do not implement the prevention program uh, thoroughly. So for example, just like uh, take uh, United States as example. So the uh, reopen or economic, uh, um, you do not have good control. The number of cases, new cases, uh, suddenly increased in the past few days. Uh, even in China, Japan, Korea, if we do not implement in the program uh, consistently, the epidemic could be coming back very quick. So in the winter, it may be even worse. For the vaccine, I think it uh, provides promising uh, hope. Uh, optimistically, it could be ready for use in, at the end of this year. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Dr. Stanley, please. Yes, the, the, we are not sure the when next big wave the come, but uh, at least uh, our the the previous big wave was triggered by the many imported cases from different the parts of the world, and uh, if we open the border now. Uh, without proper planning, uh, we may have another big wave. So we have to uh, have uh, the proper planning the, the in opening the border. We have to open the border, but uh, uh, we cannot close the border for min many years. So uh, we have to open the border, but uh, when we open the border, we have to be very careful. And uh, we are not sure if this virus followed the, the, the similar seasonality with influenza and other respiratory viruses. But uh, uh, we have to be prepared for the the, the coming the winter, and uh, the, so the the with the using the this the 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 period the, with uh, the lower number of cases, the, we should develop uh, more the effective the control measures uh, during this time, and for the vaccine we are not sure that the, there are some. The promising vaccines, They're also in, in Japan, but uh, the, we are not sure if the the safe and effective vaccines the, will be available in near future. Even the, the vaccine is developed, the, we need to deliver the vaccine to the many people in the world. Mm -hmm. It takes more time, and uh, the developing the vaccine does not provide the 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 solution, the immediate solution. So the, the, we have to develop our the more effective control measure the, for coming weeks or coming months the, the, to be prepared for the, the, the next the, the, the wave. Thank you. Thank you very much to doctors. So for the time being, we have to live with COVID-19 for several coming months or even uh, a few years with wisdom. And next question, uh, let's welcome another uh, audience uh, in, in China. Hello, um, good afternoon, distinguished panelists and the host. Uh, my name is Ming Chi and I am a PhD student at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, I, my question would be, China, Japan and the Republic of Korea have developed a trilateral cooperation scheme to address uh, infectious diseases 
and it is always useful to obtain information on cases and treatment from other countries. So my question is, what aspects of trilateral cooperation on infectious disease need to be strengthened in the, in the near future? This question is open to all panelists and thank you for giving me the chance to answer this question. Thank you very much for your good and very important question. So, as she said, law is open so that any doctor volunteer to answer. Or well, for the time being, un until somebody I is appearing, uh, let me briefly say that I think there are two aspects for trilateral cooperation. The one needs the communication or cooperation among you, experts or doctors. Uh, what I know is that you always, almost always, keep good communication among three countries. But maybe there, there will be some room to further strengthen. And second one is, is broader uh, cooperation among government officials, especially of health ministers. So, as I said uh, in the opening remarks, uh, we have trilateral health ministers meeting, and that is a uh, indispensable foundation of this today's uh, webinar. And clearly, we want to strengthen the cooperation, close cooperation, so that anybody try to answer to strengthen the communication or collaboration or cooperation among three countries? I think it's very important, particularly for China, Japan and Korea. We are um, uh, three countries that have early epidemic and all brought under control. Mm -hmm. As uh, one of guests just said, we cannot close the border for the uh, rest of the time. The border will open, then uh, uh, a few areas I think it could strengthen the collaboration. As you just mentioned about information sharing, in the early uh, epidemic, we shared our information with Japan, with Korea, once even we do not know the etiology, then I think a scientific uh, uh, research can uh, collaborate to understanding uh, the virus to uh, respond to the epidemic. Third is the government uh, uh, collaboration for the future, how to uh, respond to this uh, epidemic, particularly when the border open, we have more exchange among uh, China and Japan and Korea, how to uh, set up agreement as a, a common uh, control strategy we shared and uh, we can uh, keep the economic uh, and social life back to the normal at the same time, uh, we can control the epidemic at the minimum level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very constructive answer. Okay, this will be almost uh, the end of the Q&A session. Uh, but uh, just before closing, Dr. Wu, Dr. Oshitani, Dr. Lee, um, I'd like you to talk uh, briefly something, anything or any message which you didn't have time to touch upon. So how about Dr. Wu? To give uh, last minute, uh, I think uh, we need more uh, collaboration, not like this uh, exchange. In the future, uh, this uh, frequency will be uh, increased and we hope we'll work with you in the future more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ustani. Yes, the, as Dr. Wu mentioned, we need uh, the more collaboration. Uh, although the borders are virtually closed, uh, we have internet and uh, we have this kind of uh, the web, the, the based uh, the conference system now. And uh, the, we can have more collaboration the, in the field of public health, the clinical management, clinical field, and also the the, the biological and other the scientific field. And uh, we should strengthen the, our collaboration uh, between countries, especially uh, among these three countries. And uh, so I would like to thank the organizer for this opportunity. Uh, it's uh, also 
the very important opportunity for us to learn the lesson in uh, the Republic of Korea and the China. And uh, we need to have uh, the, the, this kind of opportunity more often uh, to share our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. At first, thank you for your invitation. Uh, I agree with all speakers' opinion because the uh, South Korea, Japan, and China is very closely uh, connected in many ways. So one country's crisis became uh, another country's crisis in short time. So we need to keep our uh, connection more tightly. Uh, so thank you for your invitation repeatedly. Thank you, all three or four okay. doctors. Okay. Oh, can, can I have a can I have a comment? Can we? Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, set, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, maybe we can uh, set up a, a scientific committee or group among these uh, uh, three country to get uh, regular uh, meetings to discuss COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, with these insightful and rich exchanges, we bring the webinar to a close. As I mentioned at the opening, so the direct and cooperation are the keys to fight the virus and build back better together. In this regard, the webinar was indeed a fruitful and productive discussion. It illustrated the importance of knowledge sharing and how much we could learn and benefit from each other. Would like to extend our deep appreciation to our panelists. My sincere gratitude to our partner TCS, who made this webinar a success. Thank you uh, as well to our participants who, who sent questions and all of you who have been with us in the last few hours. We received uh, many questions from our participants and we greatly appreciate the, uh, the interests. We would endeavor to summarize the queries, as well as provide appropriate references in response. On this note, please check the webinar's events page for further details, including the presentations given today. We hope you could also provide your comments through evaluation survey. Thank you. Now, let me invite Secretary General Michigami to give closing. Also, thank you to all the participants. Okay. It was the first time for TCS to organize a webinar. I appreciate uh, Dr. Gumbold and UNESCO for generously offering the technical equip equipment and skills. Today, I found nobody is arrogant or complacent. Uh, every uh, panelist, so so modest. That was quite impressive to me personally. So COVID-19 is spreading beyond the borders. And our responses should also be beyond the border or international. And in this way, in this direction, uh, it will, we, can, we can navigate through this difficult time. I hope today's webinar will be useful for many people, many countries. All, and all presentations, documents, materials will be posted on TCS webpage. Keep safe and healthy. Thank you very much.